Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, hello to anyone watching on the recording. I'll try not to wander around too much, but I can't promise anything. Um, I'm sorry I have to mention the war, the, what's, what, what's, what's going on with Putin, just briefly. I won't, I won't labour on it, and you'll see the relevance shortly, I hope. Um, the last G20 summit, Putin infamously made a speech that the, um, the idea of liberal democracy was dead, that liberalism was dead. Um, it made me think at that time in that speech, and I did quite, I added this into my talk quite a lot of the time, that what does that exactly mean from his point of view to ours? What is the difference? Well, in these autocratic regimes and these demagogues, they hate homosexuals and they persecute them, and they hate people who use different drugs and they persecute them. Bolsonaro, Obama, Putin, obviously. So what sets us apart from them? How do we win with our ideals? How do we present an alternative view of what politics should be to this growth of the autocratic state? Well, we're not doing too bad on homosexuality or, or racial prejudice, not too bad, but we're still persecuting people who use other drugs. And it is one policy that we could adopt. If we, if we ended prohibition and adopted a sensible drug policy, we would increase our security, we would dramatically reduce crime, we would dramatically increase, improve the health outcomes of our citizens, and we would have a dramatically larger amount of evidence to prove to the world that the liberal way of thinking is better than the other. But we don't do that, because we're still not completely liberal, in my view. But I didn't understand that as a young man at all. It, I've had to come to that conclusion uh, through lots of experiences, because when I was a young man, I had a very stigmatized view of anybody who used, who, who used drugs particularly anyone who used drugs problematically. And that's because I went into the police at a, at a very young age. But what brought me into the police? Well, I made a really stupid mistake. I went to university to study business studies. And I remember sitting in one of those first lectures thinking, why on earth have I done this? What on earth possessed me? I've got literally no interest in business whatsoever. So I dropped out of university and um, I was, I was basically thinking, I needed to do something exciting. I need to do something which is not boring, that's a, a bit different every day. So I was going to go backpacking around Europe, like some of my friends had done. They'd gone on a bit of an adventure, um, fruit picking, getting jobs here and there. That, that sounded like a real adventure. And I was about to do that. I was even pricing up rucksacks and everything. And, um, and then I saw an advertisement for the police in the local newspaper. And I couldn't make my mind up whether I should try apply for that or go backpacking. So I flipped a coin and it came up heads, which meant that I applied for the police and that set me on a long journey, I suppose has brought me all the way here to speak to you today. So thank you for inviting me. Um, but so I went into the police, it took me about a year to go all through the interviewing processes and things, but only when I got into the police and I got onto the streets and I was, and, and my, uh, poor tutor was trying to teach me how to, how to do the job, did I realise just how young I was at 19 and just how naive I was and sheltered. And I suppose I was a product of my upbringing because I, I'd always been taught that I could reason with anybody, you know, that reason can always get me through things. And of course, I, I suddenly realised that that wasn't the case because you can try and reason with someone and they still want to keep punching you, as I discovered. As, as, a, as a young 19 year old. So it's not as simple as I, as I thought. And so I was an absolutely terrible uniform cop. I mean, really bad. I, just, I didn't deal, deal with um, comp confrontation very well. I was horrendous with my organizing skills and I couldn't get on with my colleagues. It was like, I was like chalk and cheese with my colleagues as well. I, I remember one, of, one cop saying to me actually, he says, what do you mean you don't like football? What do you talk about? And he was being serious, like completely. Uh, and I just wanted to talk about music and the, the latest books I'd read, and I really was chalk and cheese, certainly for a, an inner city um, uniform police anyway. So for that first two years, I absolutely hated it. And the only reason I stayed in was because I wanted to prove to myself I could get there. And I was sort of counting down the days. If you get, if you get in for two years, then you've, you've got past your student period and you, you, you're qualified. And I thought, the day after, I'm going to resign and look for another job. 
But the day came, and I stayed in a little bit longer because I was worried about losing the money and kept on a little bit more. Then eventually, I was doing more than surviving, I was doing just about okay. So four years into the job, I got an attachment to the drug squad. Now, this was quite unusual because to get into the drug squad, you, you had to go through uh, detective training, you had to have experience as a, as a detective, uh, and it was really difficult to get into. It was a real specialism. And these people who were the drug squad were sort of phantoms. They, they, you know, they drove the biggest cars, they looked strange, and um, you know, it, it was a, way, a, long, a, a long way outside my world. But the reason I was given an attachment, myself and some other people, was because at that point, this was 1993, at that point the nation was having the biggest ever moral panic about drug use. And the drug use that they were having the moral panic was about was about crack cocaine. Because for years, our tabloid newspapers had been telling the British public that we should be terrified of this new drug. And there was constantly stories from America how crack cocaine was destroying certain neighbourhoods uh, in, in that country. And I remember actually just a few years before the voice of Nancy Reagan on the TV telling everybody that if you have one smack of crack cocaine, one, one smoke of crack cocaine, then you'll be addic addicted for life. And being young and foolish, I, I believed it like so many people did. But I was on this attachment and they hated having us young muckies underfoot. But one of them looked at me strangely one day I'm just going to move this because I keep walking, yeah, yeah. Out, walking outside. One of them looked at me strangely um, one, one day and said, do you fancy having to go buy some crack? I thought, well, I wasn't expecting that question. But yeah, I'm going, going for anything, yeah. And so there's a quickly a bit of an, an ops point set up. So I was being watched and, and I was given 20 quid and I was sent to this terraced house in the city of Derby. I knocked on this door and this huge guy answered the door and he said, who are you? You're not a fucking student, are you? I fucking hate students. And at that moment, I thought, I've got no idea who I am because I haven't thought of a cover story at all. But I thought, that'll do. Yeah, I'm a student, yeah. And this woman behind him said, well, is he stupid or what? You just told him you hate students. And he says, yeah, but what's, what fool would actually admit to it? So he laughed and he says, yeah, all right, what do you want? And I said, I'll have a 20 pound stone, please. And he gave <laughs> And he, he gave me a little paper twist out of a selection in his hand and I gave him the 20 quid and I walked back to the drug squad like that. I've got, I've got it. And easy as it was that day, that then defined the next 14 years of my life or the rest of my life up to this point. Because the drug squad realised well, that this was an easy way to get the numbers up. Because there was a huge amount of pressure from the home office to the constabularies at that time. Because the, the, this moral panic that had been whipped up by the newspapers played out politically. Because as soon as we did get some crack cocaine in the streets, suddenly there was pressure on politicians to do something about it. So the Home Office directed all of the police, all of the constabularies, all of the chief constables to make drug crime the number one priority. Number one over domestic violence or any other policing consideration at all, the number one priority. And budgets were boosted significantly as, as a result of that policy, to be spent on drugs investigations. Which is why I, where I came in, at the perfect melting point, really. Um, because that kind of undercover work hadn't happened in the UK. Now, we'd had other undercover work, political undercover work or high-level undercover work, but not this where you sort of go down, go at the ground level and, and make it up as you go along. We hadn't had it. So they saw this as a bit of a gold mine. And so in no time at all, I say it was easy the first time, it very quickly got more difficult because the first person who was caught went to prison and suddenly then everybody knew that the cops had a new game, a new, a new, a new tactic. So it got increasingly more difficult, so it went from a few days operations to a few weeks and in no time at all I was doing no less than six or seven months travelling around the UK in inner city areas doing sort of six or seven months of undercover work in one place. And I had to learn fast, and I had to make it up as I went along, because there was no training. I helped develop the first training for that kind of work after four years of doing it without any training. So I was just 
working it out as I went along. And even how I dressed and acted, I was just having to learn from people around me as I, as I, as I went. So to start with, I sort of pitched myself as a travelling thief. So I would wear my full tracksuit, matching tracksuit, Nike Air Max trainers, you know, no disrespect to anyone who's really into that kind of sportswear. It just happens to be the uniform of thieves, certainly from a cop point of view, anyway. But that, so that opened up a few doors. You know, I could make myself out to be, be a bit of a travelling burglar, travelling car thief, that kind of thing. And it got to know me a few people and I had a few scores. But I quickly realised, actually, that the people who had the most connections, who could actually introduce me further up the chain, were the people who were really struggling with life, people who were living in squats or were homeless or were part of that community or living on the periphery of that community. The people, in essence, who were using the most drugs. They were using the most drugs, they had the most connections. So I started to dress more like them and hang out with those people at squats and, and, and they were able to introduce me to some pretty significant gangsters because some of the more significant players wanted to corner that market more because they were using significantly more heroin and crack cocaine. So I learned to dress, really dress down. And this, this it really used to piss off my uh, backup team, actually. There was one time when I was working in Nottinghamshire, in Nottingham itself, and I developed a technique of, at the end of the day, taking off my clothes at the end of the day, putting them tight in a plastic bag, and then keeping them somewhere really warm overnight. So they'd really stink the next day, like really stink. It worked, you know, it was a good technique. But they hated it when I was being dropped off by my backup team. So I remember one day being driven into Nottingham and the, pe the two people driving me in were winding the window down, sticking their head out the window and shouting all sorts of abuse at me, calling me very smelly. <laughs> so they dropped me off and then I started walking um, along the edge of the red light area in Nottingham, which at that time was right on the edge of this big area where they used to have a few spare quite a posh area actually. And I was walking along there for about, intending to walk for about a mile because I'd arranged to meet a heroin dealer who I'd been buying weights of heroin off for, uh, for some weeks and he knew me quite well. But I still had to go and walk to meet him. And as I was walking along this very long curved road, I heard this voice, sex for sale. I couldn't see anyone. I thought, wow, I know this is Nottingham, but it's, it's half past one in the afternoon. That's quite forward really. As I'm walking along, I hear it again. Sex for sale. Still couldn't see her. Sex for sale. And then as I'm walking along, the road straightened out a bit. I saw her there. And bear in mind the state I was in. Like filthy, smelly, you know, as I've described. I'm walking towards her. She looked me up and down and said, Cheap? Sex for sale? I thought, well, I think I'll take that as a disguise product anyway. So I carried on walking. <laughs> and I went to meet the heroin dealer who was being driven around by a taxi driver all day that day. And I bought some heroin off him, and then later on I bought some crack cocaine off another dealer, and then I went and debriefed it, and wrote up all my evidence, handed my exhibits over, and then I told the rest of the team about what had happened about the, the young woman, and offering me cheap sex, and they all laughed. And then when I later trained undercover cops and when I've spoken to it, virtually every audience I've ever spoken to, people tend to laugh. But, you know, if I think back to that day and the guy I bought the heroin from, I've got no idea what he looks like. He is just one more drug dealer in an endless sea of drug dealers. But if I close my eyes, I can remember exactly what she looks like. She was tall, she was slim, she was blonde. I would say she was not a day over 21. And she was clutching a kind of special brick. And the reason she was clutching that kind of special brew is because she was trying to fend off the withdrawal from heroin. And it was that withdrawal from heroin that had taken her to the streets of Nottingham at half past one on a sunny afternoon to offer me cheap sex. And I represented the resources of the state. And there was a lot of resources concentrated in, in me with all my backup team and all of the resources that surrounded me. And I walked right past her right past her, to go and catch the drug dealer. And she needed help, quite clearly. But I ignored her. I had no reason to do anything else. 
And I think that was one of the that was one of the first times I started to wonder and doubt about what exactly I was trying to achieve and the benefits of what I was trying to do. But like so many other doubts at the time, I just pushed them to one side and got on with the job. So these people on the margins of society that I infiltrated, I got to know a lot of them, a lot of them. Because in order to understand how to behave and survive in that very times extremely hostile environment, I had to understand them and be able to behave like them. So I spent a lot of time listening and empathising. And I would actually seek out the most vulnerable of them. I would try and spot who was the most vulnerable and I would focus my attentions on them. Why? Because the most vulnerable people are the easiest to manipulate. Now, if that seems ruthless, well, of course it's ruthless. Of course it is. Such is the nature of, 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 of drugs policing. Such is the nature of the whole policy, which basically says we can cause harm to an individual for the sake of some theoretical greater good. I didn't quite see it that way at the time. But there was one chap with the same operation, actually, in, in Nottingham. I got, I got to know him. And I spent loads of time with him. I, I heard all about his abusive father, his difficult childhood. And again, like every time I got to know these people, I was beginning to understand why they were in the position they were in. So I spent a lot of time with Cammy, and I got to know him. And you know, I really liked him because he had a really good sense of humour, but also a really keen observational wit. You know, you could sit with him and watch the world go by, and he would just pick out aspects of people and make observations about people that were absolutely fascinating. This guy was smart and funny, and I enjoyed his company. I spent ages wooing him, really, because he was incredibly useful to me, because he was on bail for dealing heroin uh, as, as part of the periphery of a gang I was trying to get closer to. And the gang was called the Bestwood Cartel, run by a very infamous gangster called Colin Gunn. So this guy, Cammy, was really useful to me. So I spent time with him. I went shoplifting with him, which was fantastic fun. <laughs> it, it really is. I mean, you know, I, okay, I had to get out a jail free card so I could just enjoy it with, you know, and relax, but it really was good fun. But the trouble is, at the end of that operation, and it was hugely successful, I think 56 people were arrested in, in that one, uh, but Cammy was arrested as well because I'd been gathering evidence against him committing offences on bail. And when he was in custody, he ended up being on minute-to-minute -minute watch, suicide watch. Because, and this is as he described it to the interviewing officers, the reason that he would turn suicidal is because he felt that my betrayal of him was the last thing that he regretted. That he'd finally found someone he could confide in, friend, someone he could talk to, he'd never had before, and that betrayal was just too much for him. It tipped him over the edge. Which, when I heard about that, and I wondered to this day why, why the intelligence officer told me that, I do wonder, but I'd still rather know. Um, it made me give up the job, it made me give up undercover work for a while. Um, until I was myself manipulated into carrying on. And the phone call went something like this, just a few weeks, a few weeks later. The detective sergeant said to me, Woodsy, look, we need you to do this job. We need you to do this job because these gangsters are even more dangerous than all of the rest that you've had any dealings with. This is a gang called the Burger Bar Boys. Again, a very infamous gang who operated out of Birmingham who had taken over the heroin and crack cocaine supply in Northampton. And as he said to me, he said, These, this gang are using sexual violence as part of their reputation building. They're doing the normal kind of gangster stuff, kidnappings, maimings, that kind of thing. But they're also gang raping people. They're, 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 they've got a genuine reign of terror. One of this, there were six gangsters, six of the gang had taken over Northampton. And one of them uh, was implicated in seven different murders in Birmingham. And he was meant to be the person who supplied the machine guns for the famous murder of Letitia Shakespeare and Charmaine Harris in 2004, where there were machine guns in the street. So all of that information 
really manipulated me into going back into the undercover work. Because as it had been explained to me, they'd tried with two other undercover cops to get close to them already, and they'd not managed to. And one of them had, was, had got in a very dangerous position trying to. But by this time, with, with the fact I was training others, and success has sort of led um, me to be quite a sort of troubleshooter. So I tended to get the more difficult operation. So I went to Northampton, and I did my usual thing. I, I looked for some vulnerable people, again, to manipulate. And I had to wrestle with this at the time, because I, I, had, to, I had to wrestle with all the doubts I was having, all of the doubts that were sort of about, I was suppressing about the nature of the work I was doing in order to, to again, manipulate these, these people. And I went through this ethical thinking process. I actually thought to myself, I know I'm causing emotional harm to these people I'm going to manipulate. I know that their lives are going to be significantly worse for having met me. I know this. How can I do this? And I went through this thinking process that the end justified the means. Because at the end of the operation, I'll catch the gangsters and society will be safer because they will be in jail. So it's justified. And I had to really push that through my brain. So I carried on. Anyway, after a few weeks, um, I, I had to build a real legend there to try and get them to trust me. So I, I got introduced to all of the people who, were, who would handle any stolen goods I could do. So I, went, I met the people who would buy bottles of spirits off me, people who would buy electrical goods, baby clothes, children's clothes. If you ever did want to get into shoplifting, children's clothes are a safe bet because they grow up so fast, don't they? That's what I found anyway. So I got to know all these people just to build my reputation and then eventually I persuaded my new friends to introduce me directly to the, to the burglars. I mean, I've been buying heroin off their sort of periphery, off their runners and various people, but I, I, it was directly that I needed, to, I needed to deal with them. So I remember, I'll, I'll never forget the day, I got taken to the snooker club where they were sort of holding court. They were was their temporary headquarters in Northampton. And I got directed into the gents' toilets, which is quite big. And my friend was there, ready to introduce me, and then the door burst open. And a hooded figure came in, went into the cubicle, stood on the toilet, closed the door, looked over the top and said, what's this? As soon as he said that, the door burst open and four more hooded figures came in and started walking around me. And then every so often, one of them would headbutt me on the ear. Another one would push me and another one would punch me in the ribs. So I was getting jostled around while looking up at him and he's asking me questions. And then he's rephrasing the question. And then he's asking my mate the, quest the same question, trying to catch us out. And I knew the reputation of these people. I became quite convinced after several minutes that I just wasn't getting out of there in one piece. And they were more than capable of anything, really. And then just when I was resigning myself to some extreme violence, he said, yeah, all right then, what do you want? And the moment he said that, the four just walked out. I said, I'll have one and one, please. Meaning a point four of heroin and a point four of crack. I gave, him, I gave him 40 quid, I got my deal. And then I got talking to him, we exchanged phone numbers, and he put me into his phone then, by my, by my nickname. And that was the most important part of the operation then. I spent the next few months gathering evidence of conspiracy against those six. And it was a peculiar operation because, it, for the first time, I, I never felt safe at any point in their company. At any time in their company, I just felt that there was a possible Im immediate violence. Well, apart from possibly one moment, actually. There was one day I went to, I went to buy uh, about 100 quid's worth of heroin off them. And I met them. Sometimes they'd get me to get in the car. And I got in the back of this car. Now, normally, they were really professional. They were normally really slick, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get high on the job, they were all really slick and, and on it. But this day, I got in the back of the car, and this enormous bug of cannabis smoke came out of the car. It was like, whoa. And I got in, and the, the guy was in the back of the car. He's like this, with his eyes almost closed, obviously completely stoned. Now, I should explain that, just to rewind a little bit, because I'd had so many brushes with corruption and, and, and death by this point, I decided to put two fingers up at the universe and use a cover name which was almost identical to my own name. I was going by the name of Woody for that operation. It's, it's perhaps a slight window into 
the state of mind I was in at the time. Anyway, I get in the back of his car. He's really stoned. And he looks at me like this. He says, Wooden Man, why they call you Woody Man? Is it because you look like Woody Allen Man? Really? <laughs> and this is what I made up on the spot in response. I says, no, no, no. Well, you see, do you remember when Toy Story was out? You like Toy Story? And he's going, oh, yeah, yeah. Obviously a Toy Story. Uh, I said, do you know when the naughty kid picks up the doll, Woody, yeah, and burns a hole in his head with a magnifying glass? Goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I says, well, when that film came out, I had skin cancer on my head. And I had to have laser surgery to have it burnt off. And you can still see the scar. Do you see it? And he went, oh, yeah. <laughs> There's no scar. <laughs> and I said, so when that happened, my mates took the piss out of me and they started calling me Woody. Seven times murdering gangster looked at me and said, oh, man, that's so mean. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> right. So, so... So that was probably the only time that I didn't feel it in, in fear of imminent violence in the whole seven, six or seven, six or months or so that I was in there, often in their company. I wasn't so lucky at other times. I, later on in the operation, I started wearing a camera and recording equipment. Now, you don't do that early on. You only do that when you're really confident you're not going to get suddenly searched. But one day, they were, they were being a bit off with me, and I was picking up on some suspicion. So the next day, I thought, God, do I really want to wear the camera again? something off yesterday and just at the last minute I took it off and said, said, said to the team I'm not wearing the camera today when I met them there were five of them not, not one or two five and they bundled me into the back of a van and they took me to the edge of the park next to the race six race team and, uh, and said strip you're 5-0 man you're fucking 5-0 you're heat and just when I was about to argue one of them lifted up a t-shirt and showed me a gun tucked into his tracksuit bottom. Now, when you're full of adrenaline and you're, you're really thinking fast, well I, I tend to think some really strange things. I think in some odd ways because when he showed me that gun and I looked at those tracks at the bottom I thought, how on earth is the elastic holding that gun up? <laughs> That's literally, that is honestly what went through my head. And another thing that went through my head when they kept saying, you're fucking 5-0 man, you're 5-0. I'm thinking, you're not old enough to have watched a wide five. This is big way before they've remade it. But such is the pervasive nature of slang, really. So I was very pleased that I wasn't wearing a camera that day. Very pleased indeed. But it just felt like that kind of thing could happen every day. And you know, I really was convinced I was going to die on multiple occasions on that operation. But at the end of it, seven months later, after seven months of operation, I'd got evidence against 96 people. The six Burger Bar boys, but also 90 other people. That's, there was no one else to meet. There were no new names that anyone was saying that I hadn't met. There were no new phone numbers to get that I hadn't already got. I'd bought drugs off all of their runners. The, pe the, the sex workers they employed. All, all, of the con all of the people connected with the operation. And I thought, wow, this is going to be just, this is going to just sweep the town clean. This is going to be so dramatic. The operation was huge. We got hundreds of cops involved from five different counties. It was an enormous operation. And then after the dust settled, I spoke to the intelligence officer who, who, was, who had been the intel, designated intel officer of the whole operation. And he was tasked to keep his ear to the ground to work out the impact. And he said to me, yep, we managed to interrupt the heroin and crack cocaine supply in Northampton for a full two hours. Two hours. Seven months of work, almost getting myself killed for the sake of interrupting it for the, just for two hours. And this seemed astonishing. But now I, I can't say with any certainty that the Burger Bar Boys, infamous rivals, the Johnson crew, it's their sort of sport to shoot at each other all the time. I can't say it's their infamous rivals that took up that opportunity that had been created for them. But you can sort of picture the scene, can't you? They sat round, maybe sharing a smoke. One of them comes in and says, put the call in, boys. We're going to make a fortune. Guess what the cops have done for us? They've locked up six of the burgers. We're going to make a fortune. And that's what we do at every single level. Wherever we have this success, 
we do a, a huge drug seizure or we catch a gang or a kingpin character, all we do is create an opportunity for someone else in that marketplace. The trouble is, that revelation for me, and actually allowing myself to come to terms with my, with my own doubts, what that did for me is it meant that I had to challenge all of the ethical decisions that I'd been making, or, the, or rather the decisions on an ethical basis that I'd been making. All of those people I'd been causing harm to, it, well, it wasn't justified at all. At all, because I wasn't at any point making society safer. And actually, I had to reflect that in the, in the decade, almost a decade, decade and a half of working undercover, the streets have got more and more violent, constantly, with every passing year. And I had to face up to the fact that that was a lot to do with my presence in that marketplace, or people like me. It's the first time I bought it, very easily. It got more and more difficult because of me. More and more difficult for other people because of me. So that was a really difficult thing to face up to, very difficult and actually forms part of, um, part of my chronic PTSD diagnosis nowadays because part of my diagnosis is that I understand now after speaking with two psychiatrists, various psychiatric nurses, counsellors and, and the like, that I have a profound sense of guilt. Now, moral injury as part of PTSD was first identified in um, veterans returning from the Vietnam War, people who'd been who very guilty of what they'd done. They didn't feel that it was morally justified. And I had the same thing. Because I'd spent so long justifying it to myself. So what we do is by creating that gap in the market, not only do we not make society safer, we actually generally increase crime. Now, one of the, the, the original principles of policing were penned by Sir Robert Peel in 1829. And these are still the ideal of what policing should be in a society. There's nine principles. And principle number nine is that the evidence of police success should be the absence of crime, not the visible evidence of policing. And clearly, drugs policing is just about police activity. There's no evidence of reducing crime. And on the contrary, amongst police intelligence databases, it's quite clear that more often than not, police activity in the drugs marketplace actually increases violence. And this is the same all over the world. So it's a con. Every time the police post something, tell, put something out in the news or on social media that they've done a drug seizure or caught somebody for dealing drugs, the impression or the subtext of what they're saying is that this is a success. You know, we, give these, we show these image to, images to the public and it's a, both a reminder that there's something to fear but it's also a salve that there's been something being done about it. So the public are lulled into believing that the current system works. And that misinformation from police is one of the biggest barriers to reform. Because the social movement for change is slowed down by that misinformation. But it's not just the violence and the increase in crime that drugs policing within prohibition causes. It also causes corruption. Now, to make this point, I'll have to go back to the story with Cammy. Now, Cammy in Nottingham, he managed to introduce me to one of the lieutenants of, uh, of the Bestwood Cartel, a guy called Sticks. And I'll never forget when he introduced me to him. He turned up in his car, and he was in his ma matching tracksuit, skin-shaved head, uh, with trainers. And he brought his 12-year-old son with him, wearing an exa exactly the same tracksuit, Exactly the same trainers, exactly the same shaved head. It was like a mini me. And he obviously brought his 12 year old son along to see how it's done. And how he, he thought it was done was by sticking a blade into my groin, passing a blade into, into where you really don't want to feel a blade, while he interrogated me to, to sort of test my story of who I was and where, where I was from. So that was the long day at the office, but I came away from him uh, having bought some heroin, bought some crack, and then. The next morning, I had to work quite early, but two of my backup team had gone sick. They'd been working very long hours and they'd gone sick. So I was introduced to two new police officers that I'd not met before. First one, I shoved his hand 
had no problem with him at all. The second one, I shook his hand, and the hairs just went up on the back of my neck. Instinctively, this guy just screamed, to, to me, screamed out that he was wrong. There was something deeply wrong about this guy. It's really difficult to pick out why, some, what it was about his body language at the time. But you see, I've been working undercover for months at this point. And, and when you're running on adrenaline day after day for that long, your senses become really, really heightened. You become very, very sensitive to body language. And so I was quite convinced he was a threat. So I went to the, the, the guy running the operation and said, look, boss, I can't have this guy knowing what I'm doing. He was great about it. He said, oh, we'll exclude them both. Fine, we'll just park them up at the end of the city. If they'll never have been in the briefing, they don't know anything about this operation, it's fine. I didn't think much more about it. And 12, 12 months later, Colin Gunn was brought down. Brilliant operation by Nottingham Inches and Sadbury. And when that happened, it was found that this police officer I'd taken an exception to, a guy called Charlie Fletcher, was actually an employee of the gangster Colin Gunn. He'd been paid to join the police. By the time I'd met him, he'd been in the police for seven years. And he was being paid £2,000 a month on top of his police wages plus bonuses for good information. Now, in the debrief of this, a senior cop said to me, look, of course, Woodsy, we know this happens. We know this happens, of course it happens. With this much money involved, how can it not happen? And that's an admission from a very senior cop. And I've spoken to many more senior cops since, and it's generally accepted that this happens. Because we can't stop it. We can't, we can't completely defend against that because of how wealthy drugs organised crime is. And I have to make something absolutely clear. This is only possible from the wealth of the illicit drugs market. There's no other form of criminality can pay for that kind of corruption. Nothing. Because there isn't the financial value in any other kind of criminality. But it's not just the value. It's not just the fact that there's more money. It's the fact that policing drugs creates the corruption. And I'll explain that to you, the mechanism of it. Say you catch a heroin dealer who controls a quarter of a city. The gang or king, kingpin character or whatever who is most able to take up that opportunity that you've created for them in that marketplace is somebody who controls another quarter of the city. So the opportunity means that they increase their market share. If someone increases their market share, they have more disposable income. And they will always seek to invest in corruption. Always. Because if you can corrupt cops, if you can corrupt the systems, customs officers, whatever it is that makes your job easier, you make more money, your business is more efficient, you're safer, you can get away with crime more, you can get a, avoid going to court through corrupt officials. They will always invest in corruption. And this is at every single level. And this happens all over the world, where we are thinning out the competition, we are creating the bigger cartels. Look at Mexico. There used to be 20 cartels in Mexico. Now there are only three. And each one of those has got a GDP bigger than many West African countries. They have used that power to entirely corrupt those West African countries. There's been five military coups in West Africa in the last year. Five. And what's not being reported in the news or the general press is the fact that each one of those coups has been, has been about the control of their biggest assets. What are their biggest assets? It's the money coming in because of the transit routes of cocaine into West Africa. It's their biggest business. It earns more than any of their natural resources. That's what those military coups are about. There are now completely narco states. Senegal, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau. They are run by transnational organized crime. We've caused this. We've caused this by trying to police drugs. Because police are incredible at catching drug dealers. They are. They're good at it all over the world. If you give police twice the resources, they'll catch twice as many. Look at Sweden. They do that. They arrest twice as many people for drugs as the next highest country in Europe. But what they've done, what's, what's happened as a result of that? They now have open warfare with explosives between drug dealers. There's hundreds and hundreds of explosions of grenades and improvised e explosive devices in Sweden. Open warfare, because they've, got, because they've tried to get that tough on drugs. That's the net effect. Policing drugs just causes violence and corruption. 
doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way at all. And in our history in Britain, we have some fantastic examples of how it doesn't have to be that way. In Britain, we used to have what's called the British system, which was the opposing system to the American system of, of trying to control drugs, which was about moral judgment and criminalising people. In the UK, um, if you were addicted to a drug, uh, heroin, opium or cocaine, it was seen as a, an unfortunate medical condition, not something to judge somebody for and certainly not something to criminalise them for. So there were two opposing worldviews on, on how to deal with addiction. The British system survived a long time, but it couldn't survive the Second World War because the whole world came out of the Second World War poorer apart from one country and that was the United States, because they bankrolled everyone's war. We only paid off the First World War for loans to the United States a few years ago, let alone the Second World War loans. So America was, became a, a genuine superpower, not because of their military might, but because of the financial control they had over the world. They could increase interest payments on loans if people didn't fall into line. And that's why we have the worldwide punitive drug policy that we do now. But it, it died slowly, the British system. There were American diplomats leafleting our politicians, having meetings with them for all through the decade, constantly trying to persuade us to adopt their way of tackling problematic drug use. And in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, when they were trying to persuade us to do this, we measured, they measured their heroin problematic heroin users in the hundreds of thousands. There's over 100,000 just in New York. And we measured ours in the hundreds. At the end of the 1960s, when the British system ended, there was only 1,046 heroin consumers in the UK. 1,046, and the number was falling. In less than 20 years, from the moment the market was handed to organized crime, less than 20 years later, we had 300,000. It's a very basic cause and effect from that shift in policy. Very basic. Now, I've, I've been trying to explain this to people for years, but my co-writer and I, I, I published Good Cop, Bad War, my, my memoir, but we decided we wanted to try and give them, trying to make people understand change over time. Because it seemed to, when I was speaking to audiences, a lot of people, especially small C conservative audiences, couldn't really grasp how things had changed as a result of that policy change. So we researched, we decided to research a history book, a history of drug policy, drug wars. And for one chapter, we went to Liverpool to interview three generations of Liverpool gangsters. Not related, but they represented three different generations of gangsters since that policy changed. The first one we interviewed, he was a right-hand man of Curtis Warren. Very infamous gangster was Curtis. And the first gangster, actually, to get in the, uh, the Sunday Times rich list, which, I, which was quite an achievement, I think, for a drug dealer. But, of course, organised crime has become much, more, much better at hiding money nowadays. Um, so his right-hand man, he got into dealing heroin through the 1970s and 80s, really at the onset of, of that opportunity. And then the second one, who was at one point Britain's most wanted man, he was, he was a, a dealer when organised crime became more organised and corporate in the sort of 90s and early 2000s. And then the third generation, uh, which we interviewed, was uh, a 16-year-old boy who had escaped from county lines drug dealing. And one of the most important questions we asked them, it was comparative questions that we asked these three, was as you were getting into drug dealing as a young man, how easy was it for you to get hold of a gun? And the first guy said, well, I could go to the higher-ups, and that was his phrase, not mine, I could go to the higher-ups and I could say that I needed a gun, and the reason why I wanted them, and they would listen to me very patiently, and then they would say, no, don't be so stupid. Why would you want to draw attention to yourself and to me by using a gun? If you've got a problem with someone, go, go use your fist, go to toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Don't be so stupid, and don't ask me again. The second one we asked, he says, well, we knew we had access to automatic weapons in a stash, if we really had to, but we'd certainly never let any of the youngsters near them, because that would be stupid, wouldn't it? We asked the 16-year-old, how easy is it for you to get hold of a gun? He says, well, I'd need a few hours. In fact, the last time I needed a gun, I went to the guy, 
And he says, I've just sold my last one. Can you come back tomorrow? And he said, but I've got a hand grenade if you want that. And he said, all right then. So he took this hand grenade home and stashed it in his sock drawer. And he had it there for three months. And that was in preparation because he thought he had a territorial disagreement going on about drug dealing. And he fully expected to have to use that in defence of him, him and, his, and his comrades. He was 15 at the time. So in just three generations since the end of the British system in the 1960s, we've gone from the control of heroin by doctors with a prescription pad to 15-year-olds with hand grenades in three generations. And I think that's an important change in time to try and explain to people, to make people understand. Because we, we just see day to day what's before us. We, we get used to how things are. We need to be aware of how things have changed. And county lines, I mentioned that because there are now 50,000 children in the UK that are at the front line of dealing heroin and crack cocaine in this country. 50,000. I mean, if that isn't enough to change policy, what is, for God's sake? But why is that happening? And journalists never seem to ask that question. Why? Why have we got that? Because politicians will just tell you because drug dealers are bad people. Well, th those children are on the front line being exploited because of people like me. Because using children is the perfect strategic response to police success. It creates a buffer zone between the police investigators and the gangster. And it works. It protects them. The kids are in the way. They're easy to manipulate. They can't be infiltrated by normal police informants because they're a wrong age. It's much harder for undercover cops to get past them. And they're disposable. And there's an endless supply of them. Which should be remembered every time the Home Secretary announces a success in shutting down so many gangs. Because the elephant in the room is if you rescue if you rescue 80 kids, 80 more are going to get corrupted into the system. You're not reducing the number of being exploited. The only way to protect those children is to go back to the British system. Those children are dealing to the most problematic, vulnerable people in our society. The people that I used to exploit. The people that I used to pick on and manipulate. The people who are all struggling with life. All of those people have got a story. All of them are trying to deal with some kind of childhood trauma or mental health problem. They're all, they've been sexually abused as children. Or they've been physically abused or neglected. One, one of them I met in Northampton, a girl who went by the name of Uma, she said to me, I can give up heroin. In fact, I do every few weeks to bring my tolerance down so it's cheaper. I can give up heroin any time I want. But when I do, I remember the feeling of my uncle's fingernails when he sexually abused me. And that starts to make me suicidal. But when I start taking heroin again, that pain goes away. So for her, using heroin is an extremely rational decision. Who's to question that decision? All she needed was a safe supply and some help, not being criminalised. But because we do criminalise those people, it means we've now got children dealing to them. Because those people, those hardcore people, the people who use the most heroin, that 10% of the heroin using population, use 50% of the market of heroin. They use half the market's heroin. That's how much more they're using than anyone else. So that makes them very lucrative. And it's the control of the custom to those people that the gangsters are using the children to. That's who they're dealing to. They're not dealing to anyone else. The Home Secretary or, or politicians or newspapers might want to try and put blame on middle-class drug users, middle-class cocaine users. Middle-class or any class <laughs> cocaine, powder cocaine use has got nothing to do with county line drug dealing. Nothing at all. It's about the problematic heroin and crack cocaine users. The kind of people that would be completely looked after by the British system by providing them a safe supply. If you went back to the British system and supplied those vulnerable people alone, just those, with a safe supply and looked after them, those 50,000 children, exploited children, the problem goes away like that. And the evidence backs that up. So we have catastrophic set of drug laws, a catastrophic drug policy, which is marginalising the most vulnerable people. It's damaging the cops that, that, that are tasked with trying to deal with it. 
It's causing huge harm to society with every passing year. It gets more and more violent and more corrupt. How much worse can it get? I'm oh, sorry, I'd hate to be the voice of doom, but this, there's even more. <laughs> At COP26, one of the key points and key promises that we made, or attempts to get promises that we've made at COP26 was about deforestation. Arguably the most important environmental action that we need. Because you can shut down coal mines, but you can't regrow hundreds of years old trees and things like that. If you cut them down, you lose them. So we need to stop cutting them down. The trouble is, many of the countries that they wanted to sign up to an agreement to prevent deforestation, they got the governments there, but the governments don't control their own backyard. Most of the equatorial countries, and I've mentioned West Africa already, but Brazil, with Bolsonaro, was bankrolled by organised crime. Ecuador, lots of these Ecuador, equatorial countries, they do not control their forests. Transnational organised crime do. Because their governments are so corrupted. The wrong people were at the table. If you wanted to stop those forests being cut down, you had to get transnational organised crime around the table. Otherwise you've got no chance. Because those governments don't control it. You could speak to the army that's just taken over Guinea last September. You could speak to them, now they're government, but they might be fighting to control the assets, the bribery, the money that's corrupting the, the government from transnational organized crime. But they don't control the country. They don't get to say what trees don't get cut down because they're not in control. But drug policy wasn't mentioned at COP26. Some good allies, good friends and allies of mine, Health Poverty Action, they tried, but they were treated as people with like weird conspiracy theories. But it's true, the evidence is there. There's an organization actually called the Global Initiative on Transnational Organized Crime. They provide all of this evidence. They study the intelligence around the world. They're funded by the UNODC, who, who actually govern drug policy, and they provide this evidence, but no one's taking any notice of it. It's not wild conspiracy theory. This is really how it is. So all of these problems are intertwined and can be at least in part, at least in part, completely dealt with. They can be in part dealt with by reforming our drug laws, ending drug prohibition, and having control of the drug market through legal regulation. I think that policy change would be the best way of fighting autocrats and demagogues one of the best ways of helping fight the climate crisis. It's the best way of protecting our children and the, the simplest way of improving our society and making people happy. I mean, look, you're the Psychedelic Society. You, you, you know that lots of drug use is positive and we need to start talking in those terms. We need to start talking about the positives of drugs. 90% of drug use, any kind of drug use, is non-problematic. And the 10% that is problematic, it's a sliding scale. Some people need more interventions than others. We don't judge everybody by the severe problems of a few. And of course, a lot of the potential treatments for those people who have got problems in childhood trauma lie in the world of the emerging innovations that come from the psychedelic world. So there's so many ways why we need to have our drug policy reform. So that's why I'm, I've dedicated my life to speaking on this and uh, advocating for it. I've, you know, I've, I've spoken at the Conservative Conference a couple of times, the Labour Conference. We do lots of political advocacy all over the world. Um, we speak to anyone, especially societies like yours, who invites us. And we are the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. So any support you can give us very much appreciated. Please follow us on social media. But if you, if you are able to, or you know anyone else who is able to support us financially, please do that. We need all the money we can get. Um, so you know, I always have to say that because sometimes one of the audience says, "Well, I know rich people. That might help." You never know. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you've got some questions. Does anybody? Oh, yes. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. And uh, I read the book a few years ago. It's found it absolutely brilliant. Um, but um, how do we really change people's overall perception of this? And particularly in the UK, because we can see things starting to change in America and uh, Canada and all that kind of stuff. But 
in the UK, we seem to be still decades behind. How have we actually changed, particularly in the face of a very conservative press? How have we actually start to make progress there to change people's opinion of this? Yeah, it's difficult. Well, I alluded to most of the answer to this question while I was talking, because I, I made mention of the fact that, I mean, the, re the reason why the social movement isn't growing fast enough is because of this misinformation. Um, you mentioned the conservative press, obviously that's a factor. But also, I think, personally think, one of the most powerful things preventing change is that narrative from police. With that in mind, that means we have to challenge that narrative, or we have to find ways of challenging that narrative, because it's literally a lie. I mean, the police are literally lying to us. Now, it's happened in different ways around the world. There's passive um, misinformation, but also active misinformation from police. Now, pla in places like Australia, you've got very active police leaders echoing the lines of the government there, so using the same lines, the same, same political lines, where they're literally bolstering the prohibition rhetoric of politicians. You get that all over the place. Brazil, lots of countries where the police are actively standing up for prohibition. We don't have that in the UK. We don't. But we do have the passive misinformation. Now, I, we know, all of my membership know this is a lie because we remember looking at police intelligence databases and we know that more often than not it increases crime violence and reduces it. So if the public were able to understand that, the public's opinion would change faster. If the public understood the extent of corruption being caused by the current drug policy, again, the public would more quickly change their minds. So we just have to find the platforms. The job of challenging the police narrative really is down to my organisation, because we're the people who can do that, because we have the credibility, and there's no cop anywhere. But you could pitch us against any cop, and they'll not win a debate, because they know as well as I do that they're telling lies, and the evidence is on our side. So it's a matter of getting the platforms, and we're always trying to find the platforms, always, whether it's through social media, speaking events, you know. But the more public facing, the better. So, so I suppose I put the question back to you, because like any social justice issue in history, whatever it is, whether it's gender equality, uh, the illegality of homosexuality, whatever the social justice issue, change comes from social movement rather than political leadership. So we all, as, so if we're in agreement here, we're all part of the same movement because we're in agreement here. So it's the responsibility of all of us to try and push that boundary and make the social movement grow in any way that we can for our ability or situation. So really we always need to be asking ourselves that question, how can we push that bubble? How can we create a platform? So that's why we're always asking people, if you, if you think you can put an event on um, where we can, it's just having the platform. If we can get more public in a room, they'll all, win, they'll all walk out more informed. I do things like, um, I try and fit in as many events as I can. And I, 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 I find it hard to turn, turn down something like a Women's Institute, for example. Because you win over a room, room of Women's Institute and you can have that, that can have massive ripple. Because there's always at least three people in that room who regularly correspond with their MP, for example. So I try and do those events. But we always need the help from people. You know, we're a big movement, we're a big partnership. And sometimes it's a bit frustrating because we have the ability to add value to what a lot of our allies do. You know, people like, uh, well, I mean, we, learn, we work a lot with Transform Good Policy Foundation anyway. We work a lot with Anyone's Child and Release, but sometimes, you know, we, we can help and add value to what other people are working on. Because we're the cops and we bring that credibility and we bring that audience, that different audience. So it's probably a long-winded answer, but um, it, it's, a, it's a puzzle to us as well. But there is something you can do, though. It's something small but very practical. Um, we made a video which was, was basically it's a social media tool. Um, it's designed to respond to police social media accounts. You know, you've seen them, the pictures of the seizures, um, whether it's a big cannabis grow or whatever it is. And we asked people to put that video with a polite comment, please would you watch this video? Um, and put it in the comments of the social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is. And um, 
it's, a, it's sort of self-seeding, so people see it and they remember and they use it. And it's been translated, it's got um, subtitles, translations into France, German, uh, it's just been translated into Cambodian, so we've got Mongolian, uh, Syrian, Portuguese, all sorts of languages, and it, and it does incredibly well in Italy for some reason, but it, it, it's really, it's really good to see that sometimes I can open up a social media um, post that someone's tagged me in and three different people have posted it. And that's really great because repetition of any message is good. And we know that it's having an impact because loads of the cops have contacted us about it. Um, and we, we, so we know it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of sort of simple activism that you can use. And I can assure you it definitely helps. So if you want to know where to find that, um, you can find it on the Only One's Child website, but if anyone's on Twitter, it's my pinned tweet. Um, but if anyone can't find it, then just email me or message me on social media. Does that answer your question, Liz? Uh, yes. Um, well, the, thir the third question, I mean, obviously no one should be criminalised for using drugs, so decriminalisation makes sense for that alone. Obviously, if you look at the impact in Portugal, less people die, less people have bloodborne viruses, that kind of thing, but, you know, I have to see this through a policing lens, though, and decriminalisation really doesn't go far enough. What makes me nervous about going to decriminalisation first is we get stuck there, because really I've we want to go for the full legal regulation. We want all of the drugs taken under control. We want that control taken away from organised crime. Because, you know, looking at it from a policing point of view, that's the only way you're going to take the power away from organised crime. It's the only way you're going to reduce the violence and the crime associated with it. So, I mean, we're obviously welcome any kind of decriminalisation, but I do hope that when we do tackle cannabis more effectively in this country, we go for a, for a fully regulated market. Yeah, I hope we go for a fully regulated market. I also hope we do it in a much better way than they did in USA and Canada <laughs> for a start. But at least we've got those to learn from, you know. But we need to be doing it with social equity because the people that are marginalised most by being criminalised in the current system, uh, in some states in America, are still being marginalised by the growth of big business, which which basically means that rich white people get richer. And we have to tackle this with social equity. When uh, you, you mentioned Labour, I was at the Labour conference in 2019. I, 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 I did a speaking event, but I also listened to um, listened to David Lammy on the topic, and he said that after visiting Canada and seeing how they'd done it, he said that when we regulate cannabis in this country, we must keep the treasury away from it completely, so that the price undercuts the illicit price is that we don't do this for tax, we do this for social reasons. Which was encouraging, you know, and I know that he believes that. I know he's completely in favour of it. Um, and now, now, of course, he's on the front bench and he's being gagged. Like Fangam Debonair is on the front bench and she's also been gagged and she's a good ally in this regard in the past. So is Jonathan Ashford. In 2019, the same conference, Jonathan Ashford said that, and this is the first time any health spokesperson either uh, in government or shadow said that drugs should be with his department, not the Home Office. He said that in his main conference speech. Um, and he was brilliant. I thought it was all great. It was so encouraging and exciting, which is why it's the, all the more frustrating at the moment with, with Labour. But 
the leadership of the party isn't necessarily the state of politics, not necessarily, because the growth of the movement within politicians, is, it, it really has grown rapidly in, in a short space of time. You know, the 50-year campaign uh, last year that we took part in, there was something like 65 parliamentarians all signed up to, wanted a complete reform of the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, and there were some you know, great names in there as well. And those alliances are growing within politics. They, they are. You know, now we have the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, which are doing great things, the Labour Group, the Lib Dems, the Green Party's manifesto is, I mean, it's, per it's brilliant. So, you know, political change is coming, but we just have to keep the social movement growing because it's the social movement that comes that comes first. As to your second question, well, God, I mean, the attitudes of police, they have changed drastically in the last few years. When I was in the job, and when I used to work with people who were very zealous, they were in the covert policing world. They were, they were really driven people. And a lot of them were driven just by the idea that this is the best way to catch organised crime, and they wanted to catch the gangsters, and they're still driven by it. And no matter how much I try and persuade them and, and show them the logic, they, they still believe that they're fighting a good fight and catching gangsters. But the trouble is, it's a very sort of jaded, prejudiced view, because so many of those cops who work hard on this, they just see criminals as criminals. They don't see any distinction between any kind of behaviour. And actually what they see drug crime as is an easy way to catch those criminals. Which doesn't make any sense because most of the best drug dealers I've ever known wouldn't do anything else. They wouldn't bother committing any other crime, crime at all. Because that would be too high a risk and too little gain. They're only in this for the business. So the idea that criminals are just criminals is absurd. Absolutely absurd. But that thought that they're just criminals and this is a way to catch them, it's also, you know, that it's, it's also the heart of the prejudice. Because if you see a whole proportion of, the, of society who are just always going to be criminals, then what do those people look like to you? And we know what that looks like to many cops because black people are ten times more likely to be stopped searched for drugs than white people. So we know how that plays out. And you'll still have cops argue that that's not evidence of systematic racism. But of course it is. Racism's in the, in the DNA of drug policy. It was designed as to oppress minorities. It was never about the dangers of drugs. It was about opp oppressing minorities. And that plays out at every level all over the world. Our statistics here in the UK are actually worse than the USA for stops and search and arrest of drugs. Now you could argue that the whole, the whole criminal justice system is prejudiced. And you'd be right, but drug policy makes it significantly worse, significantly worse. It's a real driver. It amplifies prejudice. It amplifies it. Now, things are changing, though. They are, because, and I don't mean changing in terms of the systematic racism. I, I don't think that's, that has got any better at all. But what I mean by changing is that when I first came out and spoke about this, 2015, I, I got hate mail. I mean, I got real hate mail. I was seen as a whistleblower, betraying the side, letting the team down. I got such abuse. And when my book came out, it was terrible. But then that abuse stopped after six months. And in the last few years, I've only, I only get support. I only get cops wanting to speak to me, support me, advice. I mean, quite often. I, I had a guy just a just three weeks ago, I had a long conversation with him on the phone. He was really struggling with his mental health. He'd come from the army. It was the only job he could get was a decent wage. He, he, was good at, he was getting good at it, but then he'd got all the same kind of doubts as me, and he didn't know what to do. He, he, he was, he was, everything was wrong to him. And we're increasingly providing this sort of support service for pe people who are realising that what they're doing is just not right. Police leadership. So much of the police leadership is with us. The, the chief constable who has the drug police, Chase Jason Harwood in Lincolnshire, is completely on our side. We've got police forces using police money to pay for heroin assisted treatment like the British Sisters. Policing money is being used for it in Cleveland. And the cops are behind that because they can see that the current policy is causing harm. 
So things are changing, and actually, it's weird in the UK, it's actually police leadership which is leading the debate in this country because it's ahead of the politics. I mean, in the West Midlands, the, the former Police and Crime Commissioner, David Jameson, he, he was dragging the Home Office along with, with some policies. So, it's, it was a difficult question, really, because things are changing slowly in some regards in terms of the lowest ranks, but overall, the police movement is growing in parallel with the broader pu public movement, which is encouraging. But I'll give you one example of how, really tangible example of how things have changed. When I was in the police, right up until I left in 2012, generally, um, a busy uniform shift, if a cop on a busy uniform shift caught someone with some cannabis, and they did it regularly, they'd be seen as a hard-working cop, because they were all bringing lots of arrests in. Now, and I've heard this from many, many cops in many urban areas, that has drastically changed. If one of your shifts arrests someone with a, a small bit of cannabis, it means they've got to be taken into the custody. They've got to be processed, and that police officer's off the street for a few hours. All of their shift will look down on them, and they will take the piss out of them and say, oh, all right, you're leaving us to do the real work, are you? You want a comfortable day in the station, do you? You're pissing off some poor student with some cannabis. And they're generally put down for it because they're seen as lazy and irresponsible and mean to do it. Now, that's quite a change. That's quite a cultural change within inner city policing. I'm not saying it's every cop, but I'm saying that's a very, very common change in sort of the canteen culture around it, which I personally find incredibly encouraging. Sam got uh, stopped, uh, when was it, a year or two ago. He was having a, a joint in the park and uh, some guys from Salton police station, some policemen, uh, deliberately would, would dress in tracksuit and go running around trying to stop 15 year olds. You know, it is just disgraceful. Yeah, it is. And he got called in. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Sorry, did you want to ask me? Exactly. That, I mean, you can't underestimate as well, though, that it's a disciplined job, and many cops will just hide behind that fact that, well, I'm just doing as I'm told. It's not my duty to make the law, I just have to do as I'm told. And, you know, you'll probably have a third of cops would say that, to be honest. But <coughs> there are those in the middle uh, that are growing, you know, they have a different view. The numbers are growing, thankfully. Hopefully, more, more, more events that we do will, will help speed that up. Yes. I was wondering if there were any specific countries that you thought have got drug policy quite spot on <coughs> and whether or not that is a kind of quick cultural shift that led to the kind of change in drug policy or, or if it was already like embedded in the way that country operates. Nowhere's got it perfectly right, that's for sure. However, probably the most important country from my point of view is Switzerland because they have heroin-assisted treatment, and they've had it since 1994. Now, the really frustrating thing is they use British evidence to inform their policy. And we've just gone in the total wrong direction since. And they've had it since 1994. They've, so they don't have a heroin problem anymore. They just don't. They don't have the drug deaths at all. They reduced their burglaries by 50%. They virtually eliminated street sex work. All of these measures are very clear, well publicised. The evidence is clearly laid out. So it, it just seems bizarre that we can't follow the Swiss day way of doing things. And you know, the Swiss aren't known for being, well they're known for being quite conservative, aren't they, generally, and yet they brought this policy in. And I say that change generally comes from social movement rather than political leadership, but there are exceptions. What happened there is they had an incredible health minister who later became president, Ruth Dreyfus who campaigned on this and championed the evidence and brought the population around and it passed on a referendum. And every time the top, every time the policy comes up on a referendum, because they do this, they have this democracy thing. 
made it. Every time it comes up in a referendum, the, the percentage of the population that supports it goes up. Because the evidence is so clear. They don't have a heroin problem anymore. Now, the Smiths are a bit slow with some other things, but they, they have had, in some of the cities, they have high street drug safety testing as well. So if you want to get your MDMA tested to make sure it's MDMA and how much is in it, you can go to the, to the facility on the street. So Switzerland are ahead in, in many regards. Um, I mean, pe people talk about uh, the Netherlands being a, a great place, um, probably because they've been there and enjoyed the coffee shops. But actually, they've got, in some ways, they've got the worst of both worlds because they have this legal outlet, which was fine in 1976 when it was designed, but it's very old-fashioned now because it's organised crime that supply those coffee shops. They don't have a regulated system. We've got a, an event in Amsterdam, which is probably going to be in June, where we're going to be addressing that as, as uh, one of the Leap Europe events. So if anyone's in Amsterdam, please come along. Did you have another one? Oh, Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. sorry I was going to ask. Um, no, it's very obvious that the war on drugs massively benefits drug gangs. Did you ever get a sense when you were working undercover that gangsters were aware of this? Um, and are you aware of any gangs today that sort of fund politicians to basically keep drugs illegal? I wasn't really aware of it when I was working undercover, but I've met plenty of people from the other side of the fence since who confirm quite helpfully, especially when it's public. But yeah. Their worst nightmare as a, as a drug dealer making a lot of money would be the market suddenly become legal. Now, I, I, I can't speculate on the extent. I mean, I, corruption is far more insidious and prevalent than the general public generally understands. If anyone ever watches um, Line of Duty, um, all about police corruption, you know, people find that far fetched. Yes, there's some elements of the drama that's far fetched, but the levels of corruption isn't. It's really not. You know, it really is that bad, and the consultants for that show are extremely well informed. But in terms of corrupting politicians to keep the illicit market in place, I don't think we're quite there yet in the UK, but it's more than possible because it does happen around the world. I mean, I've, I've mentioned West Africa. No one's legalising those markets in West Africa because they'd be shot. Same in Mexico. People have been shot. Politicians have been blackmailed who even talks about it. The fact that they've got a decriminalisation of cannabis policy happening, they've let that happen because that's not going to interfere with the market. But you start trying to regulate in Mexico, you see what happens. It's happened in Colombia. Politicians who have spoken out have been murdered or blackmailed, accused of corruption. They've, been, you know, they've, they've had fake news destroying their careers. So it does happen. I just hope that we come to our centres in our smug, stable democracies as we like to see them before we get to that stage, or hopefully we're not at that stage already. I mean, yeah, the social movement's growing for a variety of reasons. And one of those reasons is the fact that younger people have increasing have been using more drugs than their former generation. Those people are growing up. So the, that suggests that the movement will grow because of that. But there is a risk because I, I was around with the, the rave culture between 88 95, you know, I went to some of the raves, the, the music was, I loved the music, it was incredible. And there was a lot of people involved in that. There was a lot of people who used to go and be part of that community. And a lot of those people now have grown up and had kids and they're forgetting that they had that freedom and it didn't kill them. And so it's not necessarily the case with everybody. So I think part of our responsibilities in the growth of this movement is to remind people that they will always have this responsibility to, peop to people who have been caught 
to, pe to people who do, do need help. And we shouldn't just smugly accept the fact that we're safe, we've never been called, and so it's fine. You know, it, there's a, and I also find it very, a little bit frustrating, because I go to a lot of festivals, I'm a music obsessive, and some of the festivals I've been to are, they're quite privileged, because you have to, they're quite expensive things, aren't they? But people using, and you see most people using something, at least 80%, I've seen a survey in some one festival, it's not been published, but it's showed 80%. Of the people, 80% of the adults attending this festival consume some kind of illicit drug. And people attend these festivals and they're really safe, they've got virtually no chance of being caught. And they're quite often middle class people who haven't got, a, who, they don't have a passing thought for the people who can't afford to go to those safer places. They can't afford to do that grand expenditure. They're just using drugs in places where they're at risk, in inner cities, where the police will look for them and prey on them. So I, f I find it, I just find some aspects of modern drug consumption a little bit frustrating in that, that this movement could be bigger if people would just have the, mod the moral courage to speak out and, and not just think I'm all right, Jack. So I, I hope you're right that as with every year passing year, people are growing older and, and influencing the movement more, but I just hope people remember that they've got a responsibility to everybody else. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, I, I concentrate on heroin and crack because that's most of the work that I did. But, of course, the people use lots of other drugs and most, I mean, many of them are used completely safely. So, I mean, psychedelics, most of them are considered some of the safest drugs that, that people can use and there's probably net benefit rather than anything negative about the vast majority of them. Even MDMA, where you quite often see um, in the press that someone's died or you know, there's been some youthful misadventure with it, but MDMA is the perfect example of a drug that's not banned because it's dangerous, it's dangerous because it's banned. Because the deaths are because it's not regulated. Either it's not what people expect, that there's something in it that doesn't, it's not what they wanted, or it's four or five times the dose, and it's too much for people who are, who are, who are particularly young. And regulation overnight would solve that problem. MDMA deaths and problems would be extremely rare. There's even a test, you're a medical student, aren't you? There's even a test that can be done where there are, there's a very tiny percentage of people who are genetically disposed to be more at greater risk with MDMA use. You could test them. And that would also be a great preventative bit of regulation. So there's, there's, no, there's no excuses really. And of course, and also we should champion the cultures that go along with these drugs. We should celebrate them. You know, if people want to take MDMA and dance in a field, then who, who should be able to judge that? I mean, who, who should be able to judge it? You know, it's to, to dance around the campfire, to dance in a celebratory collective way. You know, it, it dates back to the origins of language. This is part of who we are. And we should, shouldn't be shy in celebrating that. And we should celebrate that at every, at every, at every opportunity we can, because that is the, that positive, that positive aspect of the social movement is also important to win people around, because that's how we beat the prejudice. That's how we break the stigma about the behaviour of other people. Because this is just like you, know, you, you hear the language about people who use different drugs, and it's just like the BBC One in the 1970s when they talk about homosexuals. It's the same kind of awful, just stigmatising language and misunderstanding and it's reinforced all of the time because, because we don't challenge it. So we have to challenge it every, every chance we get, I, I would think. No matter what the drug, because you know, I, I remember being taken to task by Carl Hart, the brilliant Professor Carl Hart, um, when I talked about the positives of, of psychedelics being an important... I, I, I see it you know, the emerging science and the positive possibilities of psychedelics is a really useful tool in persuading the public to change their minds on drug policy. So 
he made the point that psychedelic exceptionalism is a big risk because psychedelics aren't everybody's drug of choice. And he said to me, my drug of choice, drugs of choice, is heroin and cocaine. Whereas some people like to take LSD. I like to run speed for them. So. I don't want to be... Yeah, Professor Carl Hart. Yeah. Um, he wrote um, My Society... Um, what's his most recent book? Brilliant. Really great reads. He's a fantastic man. But he's, you know, he's made it his mission to be public. He said, that's, that's the drugs I like. And I, do, I refuse to be judged for it. Fair, fair comment, really. It's just great, great to hear from a professor of um, New York University. So there's, there is risk in championing it. But, I, but, of course, politically, I take his point, but politically, psychedelics are incredibly, incredibly important to the wider struggle because... Cannabis has been accepted because it was championed as a medical treatment first, because it was rehabilitated in the minds of the public, because it was seen to be useful. Now you get support for the use of cannabis. It's the, the mo one of the most supported demographics in this country, according to polling, for medical cannabis is the over 65s. And of course, because the over 65s are getting aches and pains and they're wondering if cannabis can help. So we need to rehabilitate psychedelics in the same way. We need to be celebrating the medical benefits and pushing the boundaries and trying to find ways where they can be legitimately used. And I, I applaud the Canadian government for what they announced in the last few weeks because the Canadian government has sort of sidestepped the normal um, bureaucratic considerations <coughs> to allow general practitioners to actually refer people to psychedelic therapy which is incredible. I mean, that's a real game changer because you're gonna start getting faster evidence from cannabis. Um, so you know, this is one of the types of campaigns that we, we're working on at Flint UK. We've got, we're building towards uh, a conference which is hopefully gonna push the boundaries of that kind of conversation as well. So look out for that in the autumn. Well, we've probably got time for one more question if anyone has one, um, but if not. Yeah. Um, have you taken any drugs? Have I taken any drugs? Um, pub when a journalist asks me that question, what I normally say is I refuse to answer that question because I stand in solidarity with everyone out there who is persecuted for their, drug of, for the, for their use of drugs. So I refuse to answer the question. So on the radio, I generally refuse to answer the question. But have I, have I done drugs? Um, I've done some drugs undercover, um, as, as, it, as it's clear in my book. But if we're going to the pub afterwards, I'll go into more detail. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. <laughs> <laughs>